Man, once again, Andrew and Julie, thank you so much for leading us this morning. Mark and JJ and Jennifer at the back, thank you guys for pulling this off. Again, we know, we admit this is not how we, we want to be. We want to, to be all together, well, except for a few of you introverts, but, but most of us, we want to be together. We can't wait to, to see each other and hug one another and um, all that, but until then, this is what we do. I was... I was thinking we sang, Julie sang and led us in this song, and one of the lines said, you are my life, and I think one of the things that's happening, maybe in your life and mine, is realizing that some other things had crept in and become uh, my life, and God has a way of stripping the chaff away, stripping the other things away, and I think he's doing that. I also pray during this time that you find yourself, um, as we are and should be praying for hope and praying for healing of people and economies and all of that, I had a family member that years ago was, was very sick, and, and, and a good friend guided her in that moment as she was praying for healing and just cautioned her and said, make sure that you are seeking the healer more than you're seeking the healing in that time. And I thought that was such a, a good word and so appropriate uh, for today. I'm very encouraged when I, when I have spoken to several of you and get reports from Pastor Chris as well. That so far, as we've asked, do you need help? Do you need anything the majority of you, almost all of you are saying, no, As a matter of fact, how can I help? When you find someone that needs something, let me know. And I hope that continues, but I do just want to say this, that, that you have been giving um, and you are giving to, to be able to help people. So if you find yourself in need in the next few weeks, no shame in that. Please let us know if we ask or even if we don't, hey, I, I have been let go. I do need some help. Uh, with the power bill. I do need some help with some food, and we want to be quick to, to help you in that. I also love how you're staying connected. Pastor Chris this afternoon is doing some premarital counseling, even via Zoom. And so um, I just pray that we would all continue to stay connected as much as we can until the Lord allows us to be back together, and, and we look forward to that day. I want to read our text this morning for you. You can read along with me at home. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 26, finishing that chapter, on through chapter 4, verse 7. Listen to the word of God. For through faith you were all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Instead, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. Pray with me. Father. I pray your word this morning. I thank you for your word. I pray it finds good, tender hearts, good soil that we might be encouraged, we might be challenged, we might be exhorted to understand all that we are and, and to be all that you desire us to be, to do all that you desire us to do. We come now under the authority of your word. Teach us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So we've been talking the last couple of weeks about the law and the law's relationship to the gospel. This is what Martin Luther had to say about this. You you know that this letter, this particular letter was instrumental in his life and and just the very concept of the gospel, life-changing for him and then because of him and others, life-changing for the rest of us. But this is what he said. The true use of the law that I know that by the law... I am being brought to an acknowledgement of sin and am being humbled so that I may come to Christ and be justified by faith. That is, Luther says, the true use of the law that I am humbled that I might be justified. This is what the true gospel does. This is what the real gospel does, not the false gospels, not the distorted gospels that Paul is preaching against to the Galatians. This is what the true gospel does. I hope that you and I, through this letter, are being humbled. See, legalism, self-righteousness has an evil opposite twin called antinomianism. The gospel is not a dumbing down of God's standard. That would be a a terrible mistake to make. In in light of today's society, if you think of, uh, you know, if your children play soccer, um, this this is not participation trophies. To, in order not to hurt anybody's feelings, everybody just gets a pass. That's not what the gospel does. The standard, the gospel has not lowered the standard of God It's just that the standard has been met. The gospel does not lower God's standard. Listen to what God says in Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power. The Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Sin is always punished. What what the gospel is doing, what it should do, what it always does is it exposes sinners and it reassures saints. And I hope both of those are happening in this letter. And so then you find yourself, I hope, justified Christian and and yet we can sometimes stop there and many do And that's it, but I I hope it prompts some questions. So what now? I mean, is it just fire insurance? Is it just that I know that I'm safe, that when I pass, if that's in the next week or, or 50 years from now, that I have fire insurance? It's much more than that we see in the passage this morning. But I think that thinking is perhaps why many depart. We, we wrangle our, our hands, parents, and we, why do so many young people, our young people, our, our children leave the faith? And perhaps it's just because that's what they have inherited, this thinking that it's really just fire insurance. And so I can, as we, many do with life insurance, I'll, I'll buy that when I'm a little closer to that moment. It's a tragic misunderstanding. And and what happens, and this is what I see so often in the church, is just a misunderstanding of all that has happened because of the gospel. Why are so many professed Christians still defeated, still angry, still bitter, still coveting, what, what they see over their neighbor's fence, still longing, still lusting. And I think it, it comes to that misunderstanding, perhaps, of, of who you are, your identity of belonging. The gospel brings identity. It brings family. It, it brings this sense of belonging, it, that, that you and I have this special affection, this special protection, this special grace. I mean, you know this. I think about your own family, that you, you love other families, but you would go to extreme lengths for your family, I hope, 
unless you have that, that one family. But, but it, it makes me think of like in a schoolyard. And a kid talks about his mom. And so you think, okay, the door is open. I'll tell a mom joke. And his countenance quickly shifts. See, he can talk about mom, but you better not tell a mom joke. Because you can end up in a fight. Family matters. I think of our own family. Team Neil. That we try to build in our family that, that it matters that you're a part of the family. We're always affirming you're in. And here's what that means. You are in and that has some special meaning. We have even kind of a, a family crest that, that we came up with and, and it has Guatemalan orchids on one side. If you know our family, we, we have... Um, we have two from Guatemala, and we have two that were born in North Carolina, and they're represented by North Carolina dogwood. And so it matters that you're in the family. Not so much how you got there, if you came by birth or you came by adoption, but it matters that you're in. You have a special identity because you're in. This morning... We're going to see what that means in the context of being in God's family, of, of paternity. What does it mean that you can trace your paternity to, the, to God, the Father? What, what actually happened at salvation? How did it happen? And really, the most important thing, what, what does it mean? What does it mean that, that I now have God as Father, it ought to resonate deep in your, your soul. It ought to have implications come out really in every aspect of your life. How you walk with confidence, how you spend, your attitude, your hope, your smile, laughter, your desires, your view of sin, your view of evangelism, your view of holiness. It, it, it matters where you trace your paternity to. So that's the first question then, and it is, is this question of fatherhood. Who is your father? It, it is one of the, the primary quest, questions throughout history that has significance, maybe more so in history than, than currently, but all through history, it, it, it has ramifications on your last name. It has ramifications on how you're seen on what school you could go to. If you could go to school, or if you had a different father, you're, you're pushed into a different line of work. What group you could marry from. What jobs you might aspire to. What rights you might have. What status you might have. What place in society. Huge implications throughout history based upon if you can to whom you can trace your lineage to, what family you belong to, and really, primarily, no offense to mothers, but, but historically, who your father is determined so much. And so Paul starts out with this massively important declaration, for through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. Not just a son of Abraham, as he said, but he's stepping it up. You are a son of the Most High God. And it's important. This is, this is inclusive men and women, sons and daughters. But, but understanding the time, it was the sons that got the inheritance. And so that, that meaning is very important. Sons and daughters, you are now treated, you are now viewed as sons. As those who would get the full inheritance. The law then drove us, the law led us by faith to be sons of God. Whether you came from Israel, whether you were a Gentile, all through faith Treated and viewed and counted as sons. I think we miss how important this concept would have been to, to the Jews, to the Judaizers who had come in behind Paul. 
national identity, tracing their roots to the God of Abraham was hugely significant. This, this national identity as Abraham's sons, they had been forged through very hard times to have this national family identity through captivity in Egypt, through wars and battles, through captivity under Babylon. I mean, all this created a national identity, a pedigree. I get that. And when I was in Navy ROTC um, back in the 80s, and so I, my, between my junior and senior year, I went to Marine Officer Candidate School. And it was either that year or the year before, I can't remember which, but, but those who had come out of the Naval Academy for several years uh, who wanted to be commissioned in the Marine Corps had not had to go through Marine Officer Candidate School. And either my year or the year before, I think it was, they, they started making them, regardless of whether they came through the Naval Academy or not, going through Marine Officer Candidate School. And, and we loved that. And all the marine drill instructors loved that because there was this concept, and I think it's right, everybody ought to come through the same process. Everybody ought to come through the same funnel, the same avenue. No one wants someone to have an end around or an easier path. And I think Paul would agree with the Judaizers. That's what the Judaizers wanted. And Paul would agree, yes, everyone should come through the same process, the same path. Paul's argument, though, the gospel's argument was, it's not circumcision. The path, the one path, the only path is through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the funnel. That's the avenue. That's the process. And by that process and that process alone is how you become a son or daughter with all the rights of a son. That's the process. And so it really, really matters that I am a son or daughter of God. Paternity matters. It begins then to tell us, see, with that title, with that lineage, with that knowledge that God is Father, that that He's not for all, but He is for me, some very significant things Result that Paul mentions in in verses 27 through 29 of chapter 3. Listen to what he says. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Four things Paul mentions that happened because of that paternity, because you are in Christ. The first, he says, you were baptized into Christ. This is the inward reality of your spiritual cleansing, not that you were dunked in the, in the pool, although that is extremely important. This is not the outward sign of water baptism. Water baptism is a, is a significant symbol of the thing. It's not the thing. It's the seal, perhaps, on on the documents, but it's not the thing. Paul would not, as he's been doing, he would not argue against one sacrament of circumcision and say, you cannot be a son that way, and then turn around and say, but by being baptized in water, you can be a son. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about being converted, being baptized by, at salvation, being converted And baptized into Christ. There's a significance of being baptized into Christ at salvation. One of the things, though, that's interesting is that that there's also a significance to be besides or beyond being in Christ, that we are baptized, you and I, into this family. Again, kind of following this line of thinking of having this common God as Father. Listen to what one writer said. Baptism is is really a person saying no to the former way of life and, and an equally emphatic yes to Christ. But historically, it also implied a gathered church, 
a community of intentional disciples marked off from the world by their commitment to Christ and to one another. It's the priesthood of all believers, not the priesthood of the believer, not a lonely, isolated seeker of truth, but rather a band of faithful believers united in a common confession as a local, visible gathering of saints. That's why it matters when we're able to to come back and gather together. We are baptized, Paul saying, into Christ and into a family that has a common identity by our common paternity in God the Father. So that happened. Here's what also happened. We were clothed in Christ. In Spanish, it says, revestido. All who have been baptized into Christ, Paul says, have put on Christ completely. I think some of us, this is what I have noticed in in, in my years as a Christian, my years in, in leadership and in churches, is that some, this is where some of us stumble. This is where some of us can tend to drift or wither. You, you walk as if you're playing dress up or playing make believe. And, and so you might believe for a moment, you might believe on a week that you do everything right. Yes, I'm clothed, but. But it's kind of like playing make-believe. I don't believe that it, I'm not really playing the part. I haven't really become the part. And and that new identity can quickly depart. Almost like you you live as if you're Cinderella. Yes, I understand this cloak of righteousness, um, but, but if I sin this evening... I go back to the peasant girl mopping the floor. It's like I have to put the royal clothes away when the day ends. See, that's not what Paul means when he says you have been clothed with Christ. It's not just that your sins have been absolved. Oh, that is a huge deal. You and I as believers have put on the righteousness of Christ. We have put on the perfection of Christ. We have put on the the white robe of righteousness. All of his perfect obedience applied now to our lives. You don't take a shower, well, unless you're a middle school boy, but most of us don't take a shower, and then go back and put on the sweaty clothes that we just took off. Believer, God says that you have been now clothed in Christ, revestido in Christ. The third thing Paul says is that you and I are now non-distinct in Christ. There is no classism in Christ. There are different roles, there are different abilities, there are different gifts, there are different things that we are supposed to do, different works that he has planned for us. But regarding value, regarding worth, and this was the issue of the day that Paul is addressing in the Galatian churches, he says there is none of that. There is there are no distinctions, believers. The context was not in this moment to tear down or diminish, but really to raise up the Gentile believers and say, you're not junior varsity. You're not second class Christians. There is no step. There there are no tears. There are no distinctions. Again, I, I think if we casually read this, we we miss the significance that this would have had in the first century uh, among especially those coming to faith out of Judaism. This was a common Jewish benediction in the first century. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has not made me a foreigner. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has not made me a slave. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, 
who has not made me a woman. And so those who, who had been accustomed to and prayed this way are now being told none of that matters. None of that classism, gender, all of that is leveled out by the gospel. There are now no distinctions under God. In our context, we might view it this way. The drug pusher, the drug user, the drug company CEO, the physician prescribing drugs are all equal in Christ. He, he is the great equalizer. And so here's what that does not mean. It does not mean that your past, your gender, your specific gifts and abilities, your history don't matter at all. You are unique. First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul spends a lot of time talking about how, how we not only um, must accept, but we need those distinctions. Men and women are different. Different national, nationalities and cultures are different and bring different things to the table, to the body. But here's what it means. There is zero difference in, in your standing before God. It does not matter how you came to the family. It matters that you're in. That's what matters. And the last thing that came is, is this kind of being, uh, tracing my lineage to the Father is that we are heirs with Christ. We are sons with full rights to all of the Father's stuff, to all of the Father's gifts. We can wear the t-shirt that says, I am the property of Jesus Christ. I'm going to speak a little more on that below. So these four significant things happened. Membership, paternity matters. And so then Paul talks about how it happened. He reminds them before Christ, you, you were like a, you and I were like, um, like a child that, that's growing up in a very wealthy home. And, and during that time, you, you don't have keys to the Bentley. You, in, in, in effect, you're treated similarly to a slave. You don't have your hands on the entire inheritance. In fact, you are enslaved to elementary principles. Paul says for the Jews, that would have meant they were under the law. Probably Paul's primary um, thinking here was that for these Jews, you were under a law, under guardians and, and tutors and managers for a while. For the Gentiles, maybe in a different way, they had been subject to the elementary principles. They were under pagan idolatry. Again, the son of the wealthy of state still has chores. He's still under guidance. He doesn't have entire access to the inheritance. But then Paul says, at the right time, and he tells us four things on how this all occurred. At the right time, the first thing is... Christ came. The Father sent the Son. During this, during this period, again, it, it pays to, to remember our history. This was during the time, the, the time that Christ comes, and after that was a time called the Pax Romana. And so from the Greeks throughout much of the world, there was this common language, this common culture. From, from Rome, there were... Uh, there was this common um, means of transportation. And all of that helped facilitate very quickly, very rapidly, the spread of the gospel. And so th there was the right time that the Father sent the Son. There was also the right plan and the right man. This Jesus born of a woman, born under the law, Divine intentionality, eternal deity, this, this incarnation, God coming to the earth as a man, this perfect plan 
of the eternal Father, this perfect obedience of the eternal Son who came under the law and by that very fact came under the curse, became the curse. So there was the right time, the right plan, and there was right reason number one to redeem those under the law more than just a simple rescue but again to completely restore completely redeem to absolve and and honor and exalt and then right reason number two that we might be adopted as sons in adoption there's a there's a big moment that we celebrate not just birthdays uh, but many, many adoptive families will celebrate what we call Gotcha Day. And it's that moment, and I remember it very vividly for both of my sons. After many emails and many photographs, that moment when we got our hands on our sons and they were declared ours. You and I at conversion adopted as Sons, our gotcha day. And so, all these things that happened, how it happened, but here's where I want us to spend the last few minutes together is, what does it mean? What, is, what does it all mean? It, it, it is critical, and this is where I think many falter on what does that all mean? We can know Technically, what happened, okay, I've been clothed with Christ. We can know how it happened. God had a perfect plan. He sent the perfect son. Okay. But how does that matter tomorrow morning? Paul says in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4, and because of this, because of this perfect plan, you are sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. See, you can know the stuff technically and not live like an heir. You you can know and not live like an heir. And Paul says, because Jesus has made you a son, the Spirit enables you to now call the Father, Father. You know, a slave can only forever call him Lord, and he is that, but a son can call him Father. Even think of how we pray. We start our prayer, right? Our Father. You understand? Someone who's not a son or daughter can't pray that way. They can't come and say, Our Father. You're on, this is what Paul's saying, you and I. We're on the inside. We're no longer on the outside. We we repent of sin now from inside the fold. We make requests, requests of the Father. We pray from inside the fold, inside the house. We graze in the good green pasture inside the fence. We stumble if we stumble inside the fence. We're in, we're in the fold now, believers. We're not outside the fold. And so to summarize, commentator Philip Ryken says this. The, the picture that Paul's giving is is this relationship that we have now with our Father God and and the relationship He has with us as His children. First, God sent His Son to save us from our sins and to make us all His sons and daughters. The Son is the elder brother who picks us up and sets us down on God's lap. Then God sent His Holy Spirit, the divine whisper, who tells us that we always will be God's special children. When we hear the Spirit's whisper, our hearts cry out to God, you will always be my Father. So five things I want you to think about 
five things I want you to think about today. First, do these promises that we've talked about, do they apply to you? Do you notice Paul said, for those of you? I think in another version he says, for as many as you. And if you are Christ, see there's a condition. Everybody can't pray our Father. Everybody, do these promises promises apply to you? Have you come to God by that one avenue, by faith in Christ Jesus? Have you been baptized into Christ? Have you been converted? Have you been born again? That's the one avenue. That's the one avenue. Number two, if so, God says, you have been clothed with Christ. You, you, you are not playing dress up. You're not playing make believe. The, the, the ball gown doesn't go away at midnight. You have been, you have been clothed with Christ. Revestido. Number three. Every other personal distinction pales to the one real distinction that has meaning, that you are in Christ. Man, celebrate other distinctions of of culture, of race, of gender, but all of them pale in comparison to the one distinction that you have come by faith, by the one avenue, And that you are now in Christ. You are now clothed in Christ. Baptized into Christ. That's the distinction that matters. Number four. You are an heir. You you have all the promises. So many of you. This is what troubles my heart. You walk around like you're still a slave. Like you might get sold tomorrow. And put over in another family or in another another house or another operation. Not sure if you really belong. Hoping you belong, but not sure if you belong. Living a transactional life with God. Well, I hope that I belong based on my day today. I'm not sure if I can go into the safety of the, the master's house. See, the Christian never has to wonder. Never has to work, never has to be anxious about that. You, by your paternity, you are an heir. And that's the last one, number five. Start acting like a son, not a spoiled brat. Not a rich, spoiled brat. Start acting like a son who's an heir of a fantastic father. Obey like a son. Enjoy like a son. Stop willfully sinning against your fantastic, perfect father. Ask your father, your good father, for help with your sin and temptation. See, you're asking from in the house. You're asking from in the fold. You're asking from being in the family now. Act like a son. You live and ask and plead and enjoy from in the family. Being a son, being an heir, is a significant distinction. And it is the only one that matters. And it matters greatly. Start living, sons and daughters, start living like sons of promise, like heirs. Pray with me. Father, 
I pray this morning that your word really, uh, for all the many things that it could do, I pray two primary things. That right now, there are believers whose spirits have been lifted, whose identities have been affirmed, whose confidence in Christ has, has grown. And Father, I, I pray as always that um, your holiness has shown through your word and that sinners have been exposed and that some who might, might recognize this morning that they're, they're outside the fold, that they might cry out to the living God to save them. They might cry out in repentance that you might absolve them even now of all of their sins. You might bring them into the fold even now. You might clothe them with the righteousness of Christ even now. You might look past all of their distinctions and all their past and all their sin. And make them an heir. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's, that's all we have for you this morning. If, if you want to, um, I, I would just encourage you, if based on this morning or just the, the, where you find yourself, if you have a prayer request, a response, you can put it on the live feed, but you can also privately email me or Pastor Chris Again, Pastor Jeff or Pastor Chris at LogosCommunity.com. Same thing goes with any needs, any praise reports. We love to hear those. Um, also had a great, great interview Wednesday night with, with uh, JJ and Lindsey Vavra. Go check that out if you did not see that. Going to do something again, I think, this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. So please respond before then if you need anything or have a praise but, but if not, we will see you Wednesday at 7 p.m. God bless and have a great week.